One of my favorite videos that I've done is transform breeding and what they mean. It's a poke studies video that I did back in September. Even though it is still one of my favorite videos, now I kind of feel like it's sort of incomplete. Like I didn't really fully explore all the implications of that theory. So I'll put a link to it in the iCard and in the description. If you haven't seen it yet, you absolutely should. But here's a quick rundown. First, every Pokemon that can breed can breed with Pokemon of other species. And I don't like calling them species because they can interbreed. So that breaks down the definition of species. But I guess for simplicity, for the sake of the video, I'll just continue calling them species. And all Pokemon that can breed are ultimately linked to each other. Like you can pick any two random Pokemon and you'd be able to find some way to link those two lineages through a, like a chain breeding process, even without using Ditto. Second, many Pokemon can use the move Transform, not just Mew and Ditto that learn it naturally, but also uh, Smeargle that learns it through Sketch or a bunch of Pokemon that can use it through Mimic or Copycat or some other method. And Transform supposedly alters the user's cellular structure to match that of the opponent. So I took those two things together to mean that Pokemon must be genetically almost identical, that almost all the variation that we see comes down to epigenetics, to gene expression. So all the genetic material is already there, it just changes which genes are being expressed and that's how Pokemon can transform. And that's where the theory ended, but I feel like there's a lot more to this topic that we can explore. Most Pokemon have a one-to-one -one gender ratio. That's the same number of males and females within that species. But there are plenty of cases where that's not true. In real life, a one-to-one -one ratio tends to be the evolutionarily stable strategy for most organisms that reproduce sexually. So that means that it's the ratio that the species will tend towards over time. Say you have a population where the females are more common. That means that the males will have a higher chance of finding a mate and reproducing. So that also means that an individual that has more male offspring has a better chance of continuing its lineage because its offspring have better chance of finding mates. So that means there's selective pressure towards having male offspring. And that'll continue to be the case until there are so many males born into the population that the ratio flips and instead it becomes more advantageous to be female. And over time, this tends to even out at about a one-to-one -one ratio. It's called Fisher's Principle. Fisher's Principle might be what keeps most Pokemon at that ratio, but Pokemon can also have sexual competition from Pokemon of a different species. What's important is that the female is the one that dictates the species of the egg. A female can breed with a male of any compatible species and still continue its own species. That makes it very advantageous to be female. So that can lead to populations that are largely or even entirely female. It doesn't matter that Kangaskhan are all female because it can just breed with, say, a Marowak and still have more Kangaskhan babies. Yes, I picked Kangaskhan and Marowak. It was a completely random choice, okay? <laughs> <laughs> completely random. It has nothing to do with any theories that are out there. Things do get a little bit weirder for species that are majority male. Having fewer females means that those extra males are probably gonna go end up finding mates of a different species. So that's not good. There must be some evolutionary advantage, some other advantage to being male that outweighs the advantage of being female. Still, having fewer females means having fewer offspring of that species. That could be why the species that have uh, seven males to one female are rare. It includes the starters, which have to be specifically bred for starting trainers, uh, gift Pokemon like Togepi and some static encounters like Snorlax, which are rare in the wild, and fossil Pokemon, which are extinct. The real question is how species can exist without females entirely. It's basically impossible in real life, but there are seven families of Pokemon that are completely male. Although Volbeat and Nidoking do have female counterparts, Illumis can have Volbeat babies and Nidoran female can have Nidoran male babies. So it's kind of like those two, like the two Nidorans and Volbeat and Illumis are actually the same species, even if the Pokedex treats them differently. I actually used to think that Tauros and Miltank were in that situation as well, but they're actually not. They don't have that relationship. A Miltank will only have Miltank babies. So that leaves Tauros, 
Tyrogue, Sock, Throw, and Braviary as 100% male species. Although Tyrogue is a very rare Pokemon, it's usually a gift Pokemon, and even when it is available in the wild, it's always through some sort of rare encounter method. So it's possible that most of them, if not all of them, are actually bred from Dittos. But Tauros, Sock, Throw, and Braviary are all standard wild encounters. We have the same problem with genderless Pokemon. There are several Pokemon that are genderless but can breed, but only with Ditto. So how does a population of sexually reproducing organisms survive if they can't reproduce at all in the wild? Uh, I should point out that sexual reproduction just involves the exchange of genes. There are theories out there that Pokemon don't actually copulate, that they just use some sort of magic energy thing to make their eggs, but that is still sexual reproduction because it's two individuals contributing to the gene of the offspring. In asexual reproduction, the offspring is genetically identical to the parent. Some Pokemon might be able to reproduce asexually in the wild, especially if that energy egg theory is true. That could even be what genderless Pokemon are, Pokemon that naturally reproduce asexually, although they can also reproduce sexually with Ditto. Another option is that they actually do reproduce sexually in the wild, but in a way that ignores sex, so any two individuals can get together and make an egg, but then why wouldn't they be able to reproduce that way in captivity, in the nursery or daycare? There are some animals in real life that have trouble breeding in captivity, but to me it seems really unlikely that the group of Pokemon that have trouble breeding in captivity would be exactly the same as the group of Pokemon that are genderless. If like that's 100% overlap, that seems really unlikely. And it still doesn't explain how it works for the all-male species. Epigenetics might also be related to how TMs and move tutors work. I was watching the video from Because Science on how to make Mewtwo, where Kyle describes the scientifically accurate process of genetic splicing and so on to make Mewtwo from Mew, but a user in the comments named Venaber suggested that the process might actually involve epigenetics rather than actual gene splicing, since Mew already has the genes of every other Pokemon. Venaber then goes on to suggest that epigenetics might also be how TMs and move tutors allow Pokemon to learn different moves that they don't naturally learn. We don't really have lore for how these two things work, for how TMs or move tutors allow Pokemon to learn new moves, so it's very difficult to make this kind of judgment, but the idea does fit with my theory that all Pokemon have the genes of all other Pokemon. You would only need to adjust gene expression in order to allow that Pokemon to learn different moves. And since many, if not all Pokemon, have inside of them the ability to transform, maybe you don't even need to go through the process of actual gene therapy to adjust the gene expression. There might be some other way to do it without having to adjust the genes of an embryo, just to do it in an adult Pokemon. And then moves that are incompatible with a Pokemon might just be moves that require too many changes to make that Pokemon compatible. A degree of change that would make that Pokemon maybe no longer be that Pokemon, or maybe even no longer be viable. If you were to change the gene expression of, say, a Seeking, enough that it can learn a move like Mega Punch, it would actually need to give that Seeking different body parts that it doesn't already have, so it would have to change it to the point that it is no longer a Seeking. Yeah, I don't know, this is very speculatory, but it resonates true with me, it feels about right. Here's another mystery that I can't quite figure out. This whole theory hinges on the idea that transform changes only gene expression, that all Pokemon have roughly the same genome and that's why they can transform. It's only changing which ones are expressed. But in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, we were introduced to the Ditto 5, a group of five Ditto that were disguised as humans in and around Kony Kony City. Now, Ditto transforming into things that aren't Pokemon isn't exactly new. We've seen them transforming into objects in the anime, and I think there's been examples of them transforming into humans as well. 
but I'm pretty sure that the Ditto 5 is the first example in game canon where we see Ditto transforming into something that's not a Pokemon. So does that mean that humans actually are Pokemon? Well, maybe, but the Ditto 5's transformation isn't perfect. In most cases, transform actually changes the user's cry to match that of the opponent, but the Ditto 5 can't talk. They don't talk like humans. They actually still have Ditto's cry. And they act weird, which is how you can figure out that they are Ditto's. Plus, in my personal headcanon, the humans of the Pokemon world are normal humans, and the Pokemon are something completely on their own. They're not plants, they're not animals, they're something completely separate. So just the Ditto 5? isn't really enough evidence to convince me that I'm wrong. But that also means that I have no idea how the Ditto 5 can transform into humans. Maybe they're Zoroark. Maybe the Ditto 5 are actually Zoroark? Yes. They are Dittos with the illusion ability. Yes. Extra rare Dittos. <laughs> I mean, could be. <laughs> I'd, I'd actually be more willing to believe that. That makes yeah. more sense. Especially when they can genetically express Zora, I can. That's true, yeah, Ditto's, Ditto's with the illusion ability. I mean, it can change its ability to illusion when it transforms into a Zoroark. Exactly. So what about you? If you have any theories about this, any other ideas, I would strongly encourage you to leave a comment down below or even make a video of your own. Just make sure that you send it to us. And are there any other implications of that theory that I haven't explored that you'd like to hear more about? Let me know. So I tried something a little bit different today. I don't know if you noticed, but we did this video a little bit, a little less scripted than usual. That kind of mistake might be in the video, who knows? So I don't know if it makes any difference to you, but if you enjoyed it, please let us know. Neither of us are very comfortable doing it this way, but I kind of feel like the video might be better in the end, so tell us. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like down below and share it with your friends. And if you're new here, please subscribe for more Pokemon videos every Friday. I'm Umbreon Libris, and I'll see you in the next chapter. I'm Umbreon Libris, and you don't know that I recorded all of this in my underwear.